The Book of Enoch is a pseudepigraphal Jewish text from the 3rd century BC. However, the text is not uniform and was written at various times by different contributors. The older sections of the text, mainly in the Book of the Watchers, are estimated to date from about 300 to 200 BC, and the latest part, Book of the Parables, probably to 100 BC. Enoch is written in an apocalyptic style, with visions and symbols, in the same manner as Daniel or Zechariah. It is clear that the early church saw the Book of Enoch as valuable, as many church fathers quote from it. It's also clear that their understanding of the Old Testament was influenced by it. However, there is no evidence that it was seriously considered to be included in the Old Testament canon by either Western or Eastern Christianity. It is in this sense that Enoch is apocryphal, but keep in mind, apocryphal doesn't always mean evil or false. It simply involves a category of religious texts that may be thought of as instructive or insightful for religious wisdom, yet are not considered inspired or authentic. The Book of Enoch was not among the Hebrew Scriptures, what we would call the Proto-Masoretic Text, nor was it included in the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Testament used by Egyptian Jews. Additionally, classical rabbinic literature is characterized by near silence concerning the Book of Enoch. Early Christians based their Old Testament canon on the list found in the Septuagint, in a way, taking it for granted. They were busier with arguing what would be canonical in the New Testament. So the simplest explanation as to why Enoch was not included in their canon is that it was not in the Septuagint. Also noteworthy is that the Septuagint bears more similarity to the Dead Sea Scrolls and texts at Qumran than it does to the Masoretic text. Interestingly, the Qumran community serves as a benchmark of religious ideological development that would lead to other apocalyptic cults such as that of John the Baptist and Jesus. The text of Enoch claims to be from the perspective of and written by Enoch, seventh generation from Adam, but this is doubtful since the book is filled with many anachronisms that would be inappropriate for the time of or before Noah. So don't forget that the book of Enoch claims to have been written by none other than Enoch, the antediluvian son of Jared. In terms of texts being more or less obvious about their lack of authenticity, Enoch lands on the side of being more obvious about its inauthentic nature. Despite the fact that many of the New Testament writings are themselves forgeries, it was more difficult in late antiquity for people to prove such a thing, especially compared to the advanced methods we have today, which makes the process of identifying pseudepigrapha and forgeries much easier and more accurate. This irony was lost on the church leaders and early church fathers, but they almost unanimously agreed that the Book of Enoch was apocryphal since it was very obvious about its problematic nature, conspicuously pseudepigraphal, and in retrospect, it doesn't really require modern methods to see this. The text is clearly aware of the Deuteronomist source and the Books of the Kings, which date at earliest to the 6th century BC. The priestly source is also referenced as Azazel's punishment copies Leviticus 16. Therefore, the writer of the Book of Enoch is clearly aware of and post-dates the Torah. The text not only shows it has adopted the Persian-influenced idea of Hasatan, Angra Mainyu, which is post-500 BC, Enoch says there are multiple Satans. See Enoch 65. One of the most prominent and obvious things about Enoch is its emphasis on archangels, a concept that traces to Zoroastrianism and which is mentioned no earlier than the time of Daniel. It is also obvious that Enoch, particularly the Book of Parables, was heavily influenced by the Sibylline Oracles, a collection of poetic revelations written by Greek prophetesses which are no older than the 2nd century BC. In the early church, there was a very popular way to explain the Great Flood which differed greatly from the Book of Enoch, was simpler, and used the Bible on its own terms. The tradition, as accounted by Augustine and Jerome, was in agreement with the rabbinic position of rejecting the angelic interpretations of Genesis 6, 1 through 6. Here is the gist of the interpretation. Instead, the sons of God were interpreted as being holy men who were descendants of Seth, 
and Nephilim is interpreted to mean great men, not literally giants. They were descendants of the righteous seed of Adam, and of the godly culture that Adam gave rise to, which Seth continued, whereas the daughters of men are the descendants of Cain, the culture that's described in Genesis 5. And the sin in question here is the intermarriage between the godly Sethites and the ungodly Cainites. Canaanites, the people of Cain, not to be confused with Canaanites, the people of Canaan. The sons of God, in this case, are tempted and attracted by the women of the Canaanite civilization. The Sethites intermarry with the Canaanites and thereby fall into the sin and the idolatry that was customary to the Canaanite culture. The only pious and obedient society of men having been corrupted, God then decides to wipe out humanity and start over. For more information on this, see The City of God, chapter 23 by St. Augustine. Another issue with the Book of Enoch is that it claims that archangels make humanity righteous, cleanse sin, and give eternal life, rather than Jesus. Enoch 10, verses 20-21 through 21 states, And the Lord said to Michael, Cleanse thou the earth from all oppression, and from all unrighteousness, and from all sin, and from all godlessness. And all the uncleanness that is wrought upon the earth, destroy from off the earth. And all the children of men shall become righteous, and all nations shall offer adoration, and shall praise me, and all shall worship me. And the earth shall be cleansed from all defilement, and from all sin, and from all punishment, and from all torment, and I will never again send them upon it, from generation to generation, and for ever. And Enoch chapter 40 verses 9 through 10 states, This first is Michael the merciful and long-suffering, and the second, who is set over all the diseases and all the wounds of the children of men, is Raphael, and the third, who is set over all the powers, is Gabriel, and the fourth, who is set over the repentance unto hope of those who inherit eternal life, is named Phanuel. And these are the four angels of the Lord of Spirits, and the four voices I heard in those days. But according to Christianity, Jesus does all of this as the mediator for man, not the archangels. The book of Enoch also claims that God requires the blood of many righteous people despite Christians believing the blood of Jesus was enough. Enoch 47.4 states, And the hearts of the holy were filled with joy, because the number of the righteous had been offered, and the prayer of the righteous had been heard, and the blood of the righteous had been required before the Lord of spirits. However, in Christianity, the only blood that is required is that of Jesus. No other righteousness has the sanctity and the efficacy of salvation, nor the power to sacramentally regenerate the spirit. Most importantly, Enoch's views on salvation kept it out of the canon. Salvation, according to Enoch, comes as a result of reading the book and paying attention to heavenly secrets and no others. Enoch presents a god so distant and aloof that he requires his angels to inform him of events on earth. As might be expected with this sort of narrative, the book says very little about the central theme of Christian scriptures, how the loving and perfect God can heal sinful humans, imbue them with graces, and regenerate their souls as righteousness. Overall, Enoch lacks the touches of Judaism mixed with Platonism that Christianity exhibits, something that wouldn't occur until the innovations of Philo, upon whose work Christianity relies. The Book of Enoch also repeatedly ascribed the transmission of sin as being from Azazel, whereas the New Testament repeatedly ascribes sin as having passed from Adam. Enoch chapter 10 verse 8 states, The whole earth has been corrupted through the works that were taught by Azazel. To him ascribe all sin. Strikingly, Enoch 70 and 71 claim that Enoch ascended into heaven, that Enoch is the son of man, and Enoch 45 and 51 claim that he sits on God's throne. The book of Enoch most definitely bears the mark of being influenced by the religious zeitgeist in Second Temple Judaism, and it grew to become an influencer of that zeitgeist.
Consequently, Enoch shares the same threads of evolution in religious ideology as what would eventually become the Essenes, Mandeans, and then eventually Christians. Yet, it exhibits just enough disparity and incongruity with Christianity that it was not generally deemed scripturally canonical, probably because it's too immature and finds itself at the older stage in ideological development. To see where the New Testament differs from Enochian literature, the following New Testament verses can be used to demonstrate how the Enochian texts contradict Christian beliefs. John chapter 1 verse 29, John chapter 3 verse 13, John chapter 14 verse 6, Hebrews chapter 10 verses 10 through 22, Romans chapter 5 verses 12 through 14, 1 John chapter 2 verses 1 through 2, Romans chapter 5 verse 21.